Welcome to My Therapist Says, an interactive experience enriching your most important relationships. I'm Don Welch, and I'll be your host and moderator as we present God, the Brain, and Sexuality. Healthy sexuality is God's desire for you. Do you believe that? God created you as a sexual being, a person with desires, passions, and compassion. Expressing these natural sexual desires within God's design provides a bit of heaven on earth, whereas acting out sexual passions outside of God's healthy boundaries creates a bit of hell on earth. During this episode, Dr. David Levy and I will assist you in exploring healthy sexuality and the brain. We hope to provide you with tools that will assist you in enjoying the sexual person God created you to be. As a medical doctor, neurosurgeon, clinical professor of neurosurgery at UCSD School of Medicine, author of a popular book, Gray Matter, and a good friend of mine, Dr. Levy and I continue this six-month series on important topics surrounding brain health. As a Christian neurosurgeon, Dr. Levy understands the power of prayer and applying biblical truths to healthy sexuality. Today's event takes place before a live audience and live streaming while offering practical biblical solutions to healthy sexuality. It's like having your own Christian doctor within the comforts of your living room. I hope you will sit back, relax, and take in these life-changing insights. Please join me as we now connect with a live audience and My Therapist Says. Well, again, welcome to My Therapist Says, and we are so glad to have Dr. David Levy with us. He's going to be presenting for approximately somewhere around 20 minutes, and then he and I will enter into a discussion, uh, raised questions that we will discuss and work on in honor of you and uh, the questions this evening. So, Dr. Levy, again, welcome this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. David Levy? Am I on here? Is it on here? How about now? Is that? uh, There we go. Fantastic. Wow, great to be here. Very large topic tonight. I want to start out by talking about attraction, how sexuality sort of starts, how a relationship starts. In my first year of medical school, I was sitting in the medical school library. It was actually the first week of medical school. I entered medical school I had just turned 20, so I was young, and I was sitting there, and it was Friday night. And I didn't want to be in the medical school library studying the bones of the hand. I wanted to have a date. And so as I was daydreaming, I saw this dietician that I had seen earlier that week. And I just stopped studying immediately, and I said my first prayer in medical school, something like, oh, please let her come this way. (laughs) And would you know, she started walking toward me. Well, my heart sped up, and I was not believing this, and I said, "And, and let her stop at my cubicle. And sure enough, She stopped at my cubicle. I almost fell out of my chair. And I looked up at her, and I felt that I uh, had this dry mouth. I couldn't even speak. And this is sort of the kind of woman who could make you write bad checks. It was... (laughs) As a 20-year-old, I was just... My mind seemed to go blank. And she said to me, are you a medical student? Well, I was excited. I knew the answer to that question. (laughs) I couldn't speak, and so I just nodded, and I said, "Mm mm-hmm. And then she asked me another question. She said, what year are you? I was so excited. I knew the answer to that question. (laughs) I held up one finger. I said, first year. And then it was entirely unexpected. She sort of looked at me, wrinkled her nose, and said, I'm actually looking for a third or fourth year, but thanks anyway. And she kept walking. (laughs) I was crushed. 
And I looked back, and sure enough, she found a third year, and she left with him. Now, there's a reason I got into medical school at 20. And so I'm always looking for the shortcut, thinking, well, what does he have that I don't have? And just being just out of my teens, I'm thinking big muscles, a car, you know, what is it that women want? And I thought, you know what he has? He has a pager. That's why she's going with him. So I went down to the hospital operator and I said, can you give me a pager? And she said, you're a first-year medical student. Nobody needs you. You don't know anything. Well, not to be outdone, I went home and I realized that the pagers actually looked a lot like my garage door opener. <laughs> I went to a party with my garage door opener <sighs> attached to my belt. And I had no better success than I had in the <laughs> library. So what happens to men's minds when they see a woman who's attractive? What is it that happens to us? We all joke about it, but what's going on? Well, the studies show us that plenty is going on. If you put a man in a laboratory and you give him a cognitive test, he will take the test, and then the second part of the test, you send him to a room to wait for the rest of the testing. But in that room, you put an attractive woman. When he comes back to take the second half of his test, he will not be as smart as he was during the first part of the test. <laughs> if they put a man in the room to talk to between the tests, there's no difference. He does well on the second part of the test. If you put a woman there, not only will his scores fall, but if you ask him how attractive he thought the woman was, the more attractive he felt the woman was, the lower his scores on the test. So you're wondering, okay, how far does this dynamic go? If you put a man in a cubicle and you put a computer screen in front of him, and you say, we want you to take a test of cognitive function, so he takes the test. The second part of the test, we'd like you to do a lip reading experiment, and we have someone who's going to observe you. Up pops a little chat window on his screen, and it says, hi, my name is Lisa. I will be observing you doing your lip reading through the webcam on the computer. He does, he, he reads some words, he mouths some words into the webcam and believes Lisa is watching him. When he takes the second part of the test, what happens? His scores drop. If you put a man's name in there, nothing happens. Now, the interesting thing is that there is no photo of Lisa, there is no voice of Lisa, Actually, there is no Lisa. It's a computer. There is no woman watching him and his scores dropped. He thinks there's a woman watching him and his scores drop and he's never seen her. When you do this with names like Dan or Danielle, some of the, the research has studied if it's the woman's name, scores drop. The man's name, they won't drop. So there is power in how we think or fail to think when we are faced with someone we find attractive. The spiritual implications of this are that this attraction can be used by women in a predatory fashion, and often it is, that men, whether women know it or not, can be very distracting, whether it's in business, whether it's in places of worship, that men 
are susceptible to being unable to concentrate well if they're distracted. A different body of research looked at how we can misinterpret who we're attracted to or why we are attracted. They took a woman and they put her on a wooden bridge 10 feet off a small creek. And as men, ages 18 to 35, crossed the bridge, she asked them if they would take a short survey. They took the survey. At the end of the survey, she tore a corner of the paper off, wrote her phone number and her name on it, and said, please call this number this evening if you're interested in knowing more about the study. 12.5% of the surveyed people called her. Same woman, but you put her on a bridge that was over a canyon and a, a, a rapids, a, a river running through it, 230 feet off the ground. Halfway across the bridge, the bridge is a, a suspension bridge, so it's moving a bit. And as the men come across, she does exactly the same thing. Same survey, same questions, writes her number, tears it off, and gives it to them. 50% of the men call that night. And the study concludes, this is what we call a misattribution of arousal. Misattribution of arousal. I think you're wonderful, and I believe it's caused by you and not by my surroundings. The fear, the stress, the adventure seems to make our relationships draw together. Well, I thought that was fascinating research, so I actually tried that during my residency. It was about this season, and there was a... I don't like scary movies, but I had this desire to take this nurse to this scare house, this fright house, supposed to give you a scare about this time of the year. And I thought that was a great idea according to the research because if it was very uh, scary, then it would draw us closer together. So we went into the first room and it, the lights were low. There's a black light and there's a coffin and out popped a, a Frankenstein mannequin. Ooh, it was, it was scary. Just, I, I was pretty happy that I was going to be able to handle this. And of course, she was grabbing onto my arm even tighter, and I was giving her a little of that bicep that we do when we're younger. But we went into the second room, and out from the door came a man with blue jeans and a, and a white shirt. And it's a black light, so the white was very bright. And he turned toward me, and he had a hockey mask on, and he started a chainsaw. Rin, 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 a live chainsaw, and he started running toward me. Now, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I've used a chainsaw and taken chainsaw safety, and I freaked out. And I turned around so fast, I threw her like a sack of potatoes <laughs> against the wall. And I ran out of that building. <laughs> well, she was not so sur sure that I was the one that she wanted to protect her from that point forward. Okay, then what is the moral of that story? So you can't take research to every logical extent. You, you've got to sort of look at it and maybe... It wasn't a suspension bridge. I probably should have stuck to the, the actual research scenario. But imagine yourself. You meet someone, and perhaps, perhaps it's a very exciting scenario. It is, whatever, a business meeting, an adventure, and you meet this person. And because of the environment, you feel this chemistry, this attraction for them. 
There's another chemical that comes into play if you begin a sexual relationship with them. In fact, this chemical even occurs if we hug one another. It's called oxytocin. And with oxytocin, it forms a bond. Not only does it form a bond, it actually, the research shows that it makes the person more trustworthy. So you meet this person in a very exciting setting, you have a relationship with them sexually, and now you believe that they are trustworthy, and your family and friends are trying to tell you that that's not true. But as they say, love is blind, you cannot see it because of the chemistry. And I want you to understand how so many mistakes are made because we don't understand perhaps misattribution of arousal or we don't understand that this oxytocin, we've entered into a relationship that has gone beyond what the emotional or spiritual intimacy can handle and we are now sort of a prisoner of these chemicals and it takes often years for someone to work out of that. So we've all had friends or family members we've tried to counsel and say, look, this probably is not a good idea. I don't think this person has the character that you are looking for and the person cannot see it. But when you realize that these types of chemicals are come into play, you can be wiser. You know, I think I'll stop there and we'll get to some of the questions. I just wanted to start out with our talking about attraction. So why don't we go for the first question? Yes, thank you. Dr. Levy, let's, let's move to a question. And, and that is uh, when we think of this first question of after menopause, I find that I am no longer attracted to my husband. What should I do? Well, I mean, medically, menopause is um, the ovaries have stopped producing progesterone and estrogen, the female hormones. So often the symptoms of that, sleep disturbance, mm -hmm. uh, can be um, vaginal atrophy, there can be um, loss of libido is one of them, mm -hmm. and um, uh, one other thing that I can't think of right now, but I will in a moment. So there, there can be a lot of disturbance. Just from the sleep disturbance alone, there can be a loss of libido. But the uh, menopause, not every woman has the same symptoms. In fact, it's fairly cultural. African-American women have a very positive view of menopause. Caucasians have a less positive view, and that often does determine how you experience menopause. Your sexual experience before menopause does play a very large role in your experience after menopause. Mm -hmm. uh, so that perception, the perception also related to the biological component of not sleeping, which as you mentioned, as a medical doctor is very common. And one of the things is that with a lack of sleep, which is very common again, that the person can have direct symptoms of depression and even symptoms of major depression where the person cannot even get out of bed. I remember when I first started my practice years ago, I was misdiagnosing people. They were coming in and they were giving all the symptoms of depression. And yet I began to ask the question, I don't know, I must have been asleep or something when I was in school where I, I, I didn't realize to ask the question, how is your sleep? How are your sleeping patterns? And particularly with menopause, the sleeping patterns can radically change. One of the important pieces is to, to somehow make sure that you're getting adequate sleep, which can be difficult. But the most important piece, I think, is how your mate is responding to it. Because the question asked after menopause, I find that I'm no longer attracted to my husband. What should I do? I've never listened and heard a woman who is going through menopause, and I've spoken and worked with many who would say that the menopause really caused the attraction to change. It was how the relationship changed due to the biological issues of which she was facing. So oftentimes that season of life, the couple needs to change in the way they nurture each other because it's a very different uh, process. 
And I might add a piece to that. Some people fear that they're no longer going to be attracted. And this were attracted to the other person with the libido, the sense of uh, emotional attraction, that sort of thing. But I think we mask the real issues at that point have to do more with how the couple is nurturing and treating each other in a very kind and gentle way. If I can just mention it this way, I, I have couples up in their 90s who are still having yeah. intercourse. Yeah. And they're both functioning well in intercourse. Um, and we can talk a little more about intercourse uh, related to the, the biological issues between male and female, which are very different, of course. So it may have more to do with the emotional piece and how you're also inviting the Holy Spirit to be a part of that process as well. I agree. I agree, Dr. Welch. Uh, first of all, right there, are this, there's a security component in the sexual relationship. There's security and significance. Do, can I be open to you, vulnerable to you, Am I free to make mistakes? I mean, what we have here is my biology is changing. Can I trust you to be sensitive to my change? Are you going to be there for me or is your love for me performance-based? And mm -hmm. many of us have grown up in a family where our love, where love is a performance-based and perhaps even experienced that acted out in the marriage. So mm -hmm. having security, do you have my back are you going to stick up for me? Are you going to still be with me if I'm unable to do this? And, you know, we may also talk, there's a, there's a male aspect to it. Well, for example, an example of that, Dr. Levy, would be uh, erectile dysfunction. It's close to 80 to 90 percent. The mean, I believe, is about at 85 percent of erectile dysfunction is not necessarily biological. If you rule out the, the need for the, the blood flow within the penile area, uh, to have the erection, that what happens is it tends to be more of an emotional issue. And when you talk about performance-based, so a lot of men are, they find themselves because their genitalia is on the outside where it can be seen and even touched easily. Not that a vaginal area is not easily touched for a couple. But it causes men to be more performance-based, and that's why about 85% of an erectile dysfunction has an emotional component to it. That's assuming... That, that the person is not, on, is not diabetic. Some of these other issues like diabetes, it could be cardiac issues. There's certain medications that would constrict the flow of blood and oxygen that is needed uh, for that visceral response and biological response. Right, antihypertensives, you know, antihypertensives and antidepressants yes. both can cause uh, ED, erectile dysfunction, but, and, by the way, they, one of the statistics I read was that, you know, half of males over 40 have or will have this problem. It's a very common problem. In fact, both of these problems are very common, but not discussed a lot. Perhaps we see them on television, right. but not right. discussed perhaps in this kind of a forum to say, okay, what, do I just need the pill? Yes. And obviously we reach out for that, the, the quick fix. And the reason so many of those pills work is exactly the reason that Dr. Welch stated, since whether the pill is actually working or not, the placebo effect of these pills, so whatever people take for erectile dysfunction usually works because it's a very high... It's, it, yeah, whether or not it does, if it's placebo, we know that it, placebo meaning that it really is not doing anything biologically, and yet emotionally you're assuming that something remarkable is happening. Right. Yes, that, that goes back to the very sensitivity of the male and female and how we treat each other with compassion. Yeah. So, so we know that even for a male and female, uh, the male will gain an erection much more quickly and actually can have ejaculation much quicker than a female. And that's because of, in a sense, that even orgasm, there's a myth about orgasm that um, in the sense of... Um, that if you have, uh, you have sexual penetration, that there's a sense where even that, that the penis itself will not excite the clitoris. And that's almost the, the component of a, of, of a male that's female that actually has about 8,000 nerve sensory 
attached to it where it's very sensitive and it begins to swell, which there's an excitement. But actually, there's lots of research suggesting even the penis is not exciting that, that there would need to be something else that would attach with that. Um, I, I think the, there's a lot of, you know, how safe do you feel with your husband? Yes. You know, how the... Um, the lack of attraction, there's a lot of things. I mentioned the security. Do you feel safe? Do you have doubts that they really are devoted to you? Second part of that being significance. How significant do you feel to your partner? Mm -hmm. And a big component of that is affirmations. You know, I love it when you do this. Are you regularly giving and receiving affirmations yes. between each other? Because if you're not, mm -hmm. oftentimes, especially as we age men will feel, uh, well, what good am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've had men who cannot have an erection who would say, I, I'm, I'm not worth anything now. They'll look me in the eye and say, I'm, I'm done. And that sense can be terrifying, particularly if I'm, I'm off a little bit from the question, but terrifying if that nurturing is not yep. there and under, understanding. So we, we have lots of literature on sexuality. And really, the stronger literature that came out of the, the 60s, which we really began to explore this, when you have William Masters and Virginia Johnson in 1966, some of their, their discoveries. This was back in the existential movement where Carl Rogers was developed, Abraham, Abraham Maslow, some of the, the thinkers in the very existential movement of the 60s. But the concept that came out of there were these st structured behaviors that would happen throughout sexual intercourse and climaxing orgasm and all of this. But the central feature that it's followed since then is this nurturing component. How is the couple really nurturing each other in this right. process? Right. I mean, the, the actual physical component, it's fairly complex. Uh, our media makes it seem everyone should be having great sex all the time, very easy. And what we see in practice is that's, that's not everybody. In fact, a large percentage of the population has a problem in this area, a very central area. This is probably the one subject everyone is interested in uh, because we assume everyone else is having no problems with this. It's right. the most natural thing in the world. Right. I, mean, just, I mean, just having an erection, that actual physiological process the nerve stimulating acetylcholine, which stimulate the nitric oxide in the endothelial cells, which dilate the muscles, sending blood flow in, the muscles at the base constricting, restricting blood flow out. There's a corpus spongiosum that allows this firmness, the dilatation. It's very, very complex. Mm -hmm. And a system that's very susceptible to problems. Add to that someone else's physiology. Mm -hmm. You know, the man is sort of, we would say, like the fighter jet, goes up quick, comes down quick, mm -hmm. and the woman's sort of like the 747, takes off a little more slowly, mm -hmm. stays up a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was never taught this, right? This right. is, this is, these are things that, you know, you don't learn. You think everyone's the same. Well, they must be just like you are. And so the sensitivity, I think the sexual relationship, by definition, needs a lot of conversation. Yes. And that is something that most of us are assuming we can't talk about mm -hmm. with the one person we should be able to talk about. I think even God made it so that you really have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Or quickly you're going to develop some... Oh, dislikes. So, for example, back to this question, not to back, you were talking about, excuse me, that after menopause I find that I'm no longer attracted to my husband. Oftentimes someone may move to that direction if they're not speaking and conversing with their mate. One of the very important pieces is that you're able to talk with your mate about your sexuality. And I might mention I was reading one resource uh, today, a, a very, very um, accepted textbook that is across America today, and in that particular research, it would suggest that only 30% of women, if they're experiencing just intercourse with their husband, only intercourse, and that's the penal into the vaginal area, that only 30% of them will come to climax. So that's a remarkable study saying that it's very complicated 
in the sense of uh, how we nurture each other and how we talk about this with each other. So when we're thinking about this menopause, this next question actually moves into even a younger person. Say, my son plays video games that have sexual themes. He says that fantasy is not reality and that it is not sin on the internet. What do you recommend? Here's the question again. That my son plays video games that have sexual themes. He says that fantasy is not reality and that it's not sin on the internet. What do you recommend? And my first response to that is even an infant, like an infant boy, can have an erection. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're the doctor here. Help us to understand this a little bit, and then I'll tie in with you. Well, my first thought is, does what we think about matter to God? <clears throat> I mean, essentially, you're saying, it's on the Internet, so it doesn't count. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, the interesting thing about what Jesus says is your fantasy life is very important. When you go to the future or you fantasize, when you lust for a woman in that imaginary world, it actually impacts this one. Mm -hmm. That your thoughts are not benign that in fact what we know about thoughts, they actually have physical structure. They're not just air or nothing. They actually form physical structure in your brain. And if you start having them over and over, they form large highways in your brain. Mm -hmm. It is tra tragic that so many of the video games, the violence, and now having actually the ability to have cyber sex on these games really is destructive to our mm -hmm. kids, not just teens, but even preteens. But my, my, my first thought is, yes, this, your, your thoughts matter to God, and I would start with the education there. Yes, even the oxytocin, which you just mentioned. So you have a little, little boy or a little girl, of course, but that's watching something like this, and they have at least a release of that, and there are other neurotransmitters that are happening. And it's a bonding, it causes you to trust, it misleads you. Almost oxytocin can resemble GAD, general anxiety disorder, which a person is a little giddy or a lot giddy, and they're not able to access their frontal cortex, so they're, they're actually emoting more than they are thinking. And because they're emoting and they're, they're built in trust, these, neuro, uh, these neuro places that the brain will go oftentimes will make an imprinting. So this is why sometimes people have challenges with their sexuality later in life is they have earlier childhood imprintings like this. So it's, it's a very, very treacherous place that this question is leading a child, this fantasy life. Well, yeah, cyber sex, any of the, I mean, it is pornography, essentially. Yes. We are experiencing images that are meant to arouse, that are meant to you know, promote this sexual experience. Isn't this why so many men will, I'm, I'm thinking of men right now, but that so many men will say, you know, I'm, I'm actually sober. I'm no longer involved in pornography. And, and actually my thought life is clear. I'm not fantasizing about someone else. And it's that they will say, I just can't get those images out of my mind because the pathways have created this memory, particularly when we think of the hippocampus is where we, we tend to have the focus of our memory well, sometimes that's long-term memory, really, with, sure. with hippocampus. But am I correct? And so that's the treacherous part early on with a child, exposing a child to something that's building these neuro neurological freeways, if you will, yes. that follow them into adulthood. It is. And obviously, the earlier the experience, the more susceptible the brain, just like your first drug experience, your first sexual experience, pornography experience, video experience, it essentially is like poison weaving itself into the fabric of the mind, it, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to get rid of, but not impossible, but the earlier that experience happens, just like people who experience you know, a drug use at an early age, the brain starts to sort of form around that. Yes. We are creatures designed for joy, to experience joy, and to experience joy in relationship, and joy produces this dopamine response. Well, dopamine is also produced by sex and by drugs and by chocolate and by any number of other things. And the more powerful that response, the more of that we want. 
So it's meant to be experienced in a safe relationship yes. uh, and a healthy relationship. Unfortunately, so many of us don't experience a healthy relationship in our childhood. And so we are very susceptible to wanting pseudo joy or more of this dopamine and mm -hmm. looking for other sources for it. So once we hit puberty or once we find video games, um, we jump in with both feet because we haven't experienced the true joy of relationship mm -hmm. um, with our parents primarily. Yes, and you talk about relationships, that that's where we, we find our greatest joy. I know you've mentioned it before on this platform and in other arenas that I've listened to you speak, Dr. Levy, and that the question here is like, what do you recommend then? You're actually saying something that, that helps us with the recommendations, and that is if a person is having a dopamine dump, if you will, and that is the pleasure like GABA, there are other, these other neurotransmitters, and they're alone. What they're doing, they're setting themselves up for isolatory relationships, which means they're not really having relationships. And since God meant for us to be in healthy relationships, then what happens is we begin to go into a self-medicating mode rather than a self-regulating because you said that if we're having the dopamine, we're having the GABA, some of these other neurotransmitters, oxytocin, some of these pleasure experiences in a healthy monogamous right marriage relationship between a man and a woman, that what happens then is the person is self-regulating uh, and not self-medicating. Yeah. Does that make sense? So that's why you said, I believe, a pseudo-experience of, of pleasure and enjoyment. So actually you need more. Right. You more of that. Whereas when you're in a healthy relationship, there's actually a satisfaction that takes place. It's the way God made us. You know, it's like St. Augustine said, my soul is not at rest until it finds its rest in thee, O God. The idea is that He caused us, created us, put DNA within us to have a healthy relationship. So those neurotransmitters, when they are downloaded, like we were talking about, you were, of yep. uh, the dopamine, that by the way, dopamine levels, that's where we run into trouble with ADD and ADHD, right. when those are not functioning well. Right. So we want to be in relationship. So the recommendation I think I'm hearing is finding ways for the child to find pleasure in relationship with the family. Hugs, I mean... Hugs, that's a great one, yeah. Appropriate physical touch, I think, is so important and perhaps so lacking. Yes. Uh, you know, we're all on our phones and communicating, and the studies are saying this is not true fulfilling communication to get a text. We need face-to-face. -face. We need to see the joy in someone's smile. Uh, Dr. Jim Wilder, someone who has really given me a lot of this information when I talk about joy, has done a lot of research in that, is he's saying that you know we are looking for this this pleasure all of, from the time that we're a baby basically we're looking mm -hmm. for temperature we're looking for some food you know we're crying out for this and so as we enter puberty and sexuality comes upon us if we don't have appropriate hugs in the family we don't have uh, appropriate touch we are not being built up we're not being affirmed we're not being told that we're appreciated. We're much more susceptible to looking for it outside in dangerous ways. I would say that for teens, this is something that... How should a teenage boy use his strength? Have we even thought about that as parents? Mm. How should a teenage boy use his strength? Because he's got a lot of strength, he's got a lot of energy. I mean, most of the vandalism is not done by 40 and 50 year olds, it's done by teenage boys. They've got all of this energy, what is an appropriate use of that strength? Because I can tell you what the media is telling them, mm. use it to dominate, use it to um, humiliate, use it to tease, use it to overpower, use your strength to get what you want, Get some money, get your sexual needs met. But we're not actually taught in our families what our strength is for. We, we don't mm -hmm. seem to have other options. Mm -hmm. You know, who are, is telling us that your strength is to help the widows and the orphans? Mm -hmm. Your strength mm -hmm. is to do good over here. Let me show you how to do that. And I'm going to show you how rewarding that is to help you use your strength in a positive way. Teenage girls... What's your 
beauty for? I mean, who's asking that question? What is beauty for? Why did God bless some people with specific types of beauty, the kind that turns your head uh, in the checkout line, and some people without that? What's it for? And most teenage girls would say, well, it's for me. It's for me to get a man. It's for me to attract people. It's for me to get some attention for myself. Mm -hmm. What else? What do you think it's for? Well, what did... What did God give you this beauty for? You know, when a beautiful person blesses someone and talks to them and spends time and looks in their eyes, somehow that is worth more than if someone who's not beautiful does it. I don't know why that's the case, but it is the case. This gift of this beauty or this figure or whatever blessing God has bestowed you with, your intelligence, your wealth, your position, it's to bless others. Yeah. And most of our teens are not learning that, so they're looking in a predatory fashion Mm -hmm. how to use their gift to get what they want. And we are not, we're teaching them essentially to be predators and not protectors. Son, your strength is to protect women and children, and daughter, your strength is to protect men, sometimes from yourself. Uh, And as we uh, become protectors, even the use of pornography, well, I'm not going to look at someone, even if they're giving it to me for free, I'm going to protect them. I'm not going to look at them. Nakedness is something I want to cover because I'm a protector. I'm not an exploiter. One of the things teenage girls love is gossip. Gossip is not protection. Gossip is, I found something about you, and I'm going to use it to... (laughs) For myself, it feels good to exploit this, to uncover you. And God says, love covers a multitude Mm -hmm. of sins. And we want to be teaching our young people, they're very powerful and they're feeling it, but they don't know where to go with it. So you've got this child, he's on video games, now he's moving into some darker games. Let's get him to a place where you can help him uh, direct his strength. So modeling empathy is one of those. When we talk about this, what to do, what do you do, what do you recommend. You were referring to, actually, in the early 90s, we had a, there was a discovery with chimpanzees that there's this mirror, mirror neurons, and that is we tend to empathize with someone, sort of like the infant. One begins to cry. There's a sympathetic automatic response by others. It's really an empathy response. So one of the great recommendations, I think, with this question, as you're talking, Dr. Levy, would be that we model empathy, Empathy would be saying to someone, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, when you speak to them. You, you modeling it, or I'm modeling it as a parent. Another might be that you just actually mow your neighbor's yard. You go over and put their trash cans away for them, don't say anything. You're just modeling this type of empathy. That's actually what Jesus would do, actually. <laughs> he would do much more than that. But that he didn't consider himself really equal with God. He kind of made himself a slave. The next question that we're dealing with, we have several here that I think are very important. What about masturbation? Some doctors advocate it for health reasons. Is it helpful or harmful? This is the question, a very difficult question to discuss. What about masturbation? Some doctors advocate it for health reasons. Is it helpful or harmful? Well, there are many views on this in the secular and the... Christian literature, there are, it is harmful, it is neutral, it is helpful, and then some say, well, depending on what you're thinking about when you're doing it, depends on which category that would go into. Orgasm does increase your blood flow. It can be a stress-reducing activity. That's the short-term physiology response. I think we need to step back and ask ourselves, what is sex designed for? Mm. Because I can use my smartphone to uh, scoop potato salad, and it will work, but it may limit its lifespan and not do the best job. It's not designed for that. It will work, but that's not what it's designed for. Mm. So... The sexual union is designed for intimacy, into me, see. It is not just a physiologic genital union. It is a spiritual 
and a physical union. Mm -hmm. Essentially, mind, body, and spirit, all of the parts of you are being united. God said the two shall become one, and it's more than just physical. It has a, a powerful spiritual implications, which is why throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, idolatry and adultery and the worship of other gods is almost always combined with temple prostitution. Mm -hmm. Multiple partners, it's all of this. So the sexual relationship, because I'm inferring, because it has such negative consequences, if not used properly, has powerful positive consequences when used properly. Properly means you are stimulating your partner and they are stimulating you. That is how it was designed. If I say I am going to stimulate myself, essentially I have to have a split or a fracture at some level where I use my body to please my mind, to get these chemicals going. And I don't believe that that fracture is healthy, and I believe that that's one of the reasons there's so much shame associated with masturbation, whether people are people of faith or not. It's sort of a humiliating thing, and people don't want to talk about it. And I believe that is because it is not an integrating, which means coming together, a positive thing. It becomes a disintegrating. I'm actually tearing myself down. So the oxytocin that would be produced with this orgasm is not really doing me a favor. It's not bonding me to anything. It's not making me like myself more. It's actually making me like myself less. So my thought would be, what is the proper design for this, and am mm -hmm. I using it according to its design? Mm -hmm. So what would you do with, um, say, you... We, we know that there's a propensity for males to masturbate more than females. The research shows that. Say you have your own son and you realize that he is masturbating um, as a young man. How, how would you talk with that young man? What would be some ways, there might be that question here, what would be some ways you could interact with your, your son? Or it could be your, your daughter as well, although there's a strong, the research shows a strong propensity sure. for, for a, a young man. To, there's some literature that says, and it's really over the top, it's saying that all, all males masturbate, which is just not true, but there's a high percentage. Well, sexuality, always stepping back, saying not only is it designed for, I said it was designed for this intimacy, intimacy, I want to be one with you, but one of the components that we forget is that God wants to be involved in our sexuality. Mm -hmm. And we have learned from the world that this is my private closet, mm -hmm. and he is actually embarrassed by it. And one of the reasons Dr. Welch and I are here talking is God is not embarrassed with sexuality. Right. We need to be discussing this. We don't have all the answers, but we're discussing it. Mm -hmm. So anytime you are doing something, my question is, are you in, can you invite God into that relationship? So we could have a stack of questions this high on, is this okay? Is that okay? Is this practice good? My question is for you is, can you invite your creator, your savior, into your sexuality, whatever that is, whatever choice you want to make? Are you comfortable that he's there with you, enjoying it with you? Mm -hmm. And this may be a jump for some of us, even uh, in, in the marriage bed. But I think this is something that we need to get over. They used to have, in the old marriage ceremonies, they used to say, in the ceremony, with our bodies, we the worship. Mm -hmm. That was part of the marriage vows. Mm -hmm. With our bodies, we the worship. It is a form of worship. It mm -hmm. is not dirty. It's not perverted. It is a form of worship. But so much baggage we're bringing into our mm -hmm. marriages because of things that have happened before um, and perhaps some of the struggles that we're ha having inside of our marriages, it makes it difficult. And so a lot of married people are using masturbation because they're not getting fulfillment inside of marriage. Yeah. 
So we're really saying it's less than what God intended for because God intended for us to be in healthy relationship. This is moving us away from healthy relationship. Right, and, and any, anything can become an addiction. Uh, and so mm -hmm. this also is a way that people use to soothe themselves uh, and any addiction can be broken. Mm -hmm. You know, we can fast from it. Mm -hmm. It's hard. The body has a craving that you've built up because you've now, you have a problem, you have stress in your life, and this is what you use to relieve that stress. Uh, often it's linked with pornography. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can break those cycles. Often it does take accountability, but it takes someone... Interesting statement... Few of us want to be sick. Everyone, nobody wants to be sick, but few of us actually want to get well. That to get well is going to cost you something. It's, it's, we want microwave solutions, but to get out of addiction often is going to take a lot of work and mm -hmm. some internal drive, and so you'll need to develop those new skills. Anytime you want to break an addiction... You need to have healthy relationships because you're looking for joy. You're mm -hmm. looking for joy, and that is found in healthy relationships, but in smaller doses. Mm -hmm. So you'll need to, as you fast from this, you'll need to pick up some healthy relationships that you're enjoying, some eye contact, people who are glad to be with you. That's not always easy for people who are stay in their room or play video games and those types of things, but... Parents, certainly, or other people can encourage them to do that. Okay. Yes, and then this next question uh, talks about relationship between men and women related to sexuality, where it asks, my husband often turns his head when a beautiful woman is around. This bothers me. What should I do? So my husband often turns his head when a beautiful woman is around. This bothers me. What should I do? Extremely common. There was a study in the UK that showed they have 2,500, I think 2,500 accidents a year from people who are turning their head looking at someone walking down the street. I think statistics 60% of men and 12% of women admit to this being a problem. So it is. It is a problem. It, mm -hmm. it is the visual cues. I think we live in a world of a lot of visual stimuli, and so we become almost overstimulated, used to picking up our phones. As soon as, we, as, soon as the stimulation drops, we're getting more visual stimulation. Mm -hmm. and so as we're driving down the street, we're looking for anything. We're actually looking for dopamine. Mm -hmm. So we see something and we focus on it, First, certainly it's dangerous to do, but it's a symptom of a, a deeper problem. It's a symptom of, of someone who has an inability to quiet themselves. One of the highest indicators of mental illness is an inability to quiet. Mm -hmm. We are used to stimulating ourselves all the time, and then the next video and the next movie and the next phone call, catching up mm -hmm. with our work uh, um, late at night, the blue light of the computer and the cell phone we know is not healthy for sleep. Many of us need to take a Sabbath. That's 24 hours with no electronics. I try to do that once a week, shut off my phone, no email. Uh, if I'm not on call at the hospital, I really want to reset my joy meter so that I no longer need all of this stimulation to feel that I'm stimulated. I don't need email. I can actually see a smile. I can hear a song. I can see a bird, and I can feel joy in myself without having to have constant stimulation. I think all of this head turning is a symptom of a deeper problem. So let's talk biologically for just a moment. I, I think it sounds like we're going to get in the quagmire of details, but this question really isn't. It's, it's really questioning if we're more anxiety prone today because of uh, the media, social networking, all that we have that is incredibly helpful to us, and yet it can be incredibly uh, debilitating for us. So I ask almost every class I teach at the university, 
and they kind of know I'm going to ask the question, but I catch some of the freshmen off guard when I see, have you ever had a phantom text? And they kind of turn to each other. What does he mean by phantom text? What, is it, what does that mean? And then, then, then I kind of give a little more information. I mean, you think it's going off, but it didn't really. Oh, and all the hands. I mean, just predominantly the hands go up. And so they're already anticipating. In other words, they're, they're, they're kind of anticipating. That's anxiety, by the way. Anxiety is anticipatory according to the DSM-5. So they're already anticipating something's going to happen. So if we do not take a Sabbath, I do not do this as well as you do. My wife is right here. She knows that with my social media, with all of that to try to keep in touch with sure. our center and keep sure. everything going. But what happens to a person biologically if they don't take a Sabbath and they are more anxious than not? We're, in a, we're not an agrarian society where... You would not have all of this anxious peace ar around, I guess, if you're sitting around uh, the, the edge of your, your, your front porch and telling stories about grandma and grandpa, and it wasn't very good, you might have anxiety. But I mean, really, this anticipatory anxiety. What happens if we do not take a Sabbath? What happens if we do not allow our kids to take a Sabbath from this kind of anxiety producing? Well, the first thing it does, I believe, is separate us from the ability to hear the voice of God. Mm. So often the voice of God is a still, small voice. It is a subtle voice. It comes to you often in those quiet moments. And if you're unable to take a Sabbath, the only time you can hear the voice of God is perhaps in a center of worship, something you've read on a podcast. You the still small voice you won't be able to hear. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is depression is a huge consequence of anxiety. It burns out the chemicals in your brain that you need to quiet yourself. And so depressed people actually have a tremendous amount of anxiety. They, they go hand in hand. It's called comorbidity. If I'm anxious, I'm going to be depressed. If I'm depressed, I'm likely to be anxious. Sort of like if I lost my job, I would be depressed about it, but I'd also be anxious. Can I get another job? Is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah, that they tend to coexist. Right, right. And so that's important to have that time. Well, I wanted to take uh, a few moments. We're going to be wrapping up shortly, but sexuality is an area that virtually everyone has made mistakes in. And I believe I would be remiss if I didn't offer... God's grace. Dr. Welch and I are saying, have patience and grace with your partner and with yourself, with your changing biology, with their changing biology, with frustrations, with being sensitive, being kind. Marriage is a metaphor for God's love for us. And as we act out a marriage of one-on-one. -on -one. I am in love with you. I'm in a covenantal relationship with you. We essentially bring heaven to earth. But many of those relationships have been short-circuited because of sexual problems that occurred before marriage. Some of them were mistakes that you made. Some of them were things that people did to you that you never wanted. Mm -hmm. If we hang on to bitterness against things that people did to us, it will destroy you. It will cause not only sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, it will essentially cause heart failure and so many other things. It, bitterness is like a poison you drink and you hope the other person dies. Mm. It will destroy mm. you. And I believe there is no greater sort of area of bitterness than some of the sexual problems that have happened to us or perhaps bitterness against ourself mm. that we've done something that we know hurts someone else. And I want to give you an opportunity now, just a minute to spend some time with God Remember, that woman caught in the act of adultery was brought before Jesus and he did not condemn her. Mm -hmm. And your heavenly Father does not condemn you. Mm -hmm. 
He is waiting to forgive. He is waiting to help you to forgive that person, maybe that relative. He is so close to those who will humble themselves to ask for forgiveness or give forgiveness. I remind you, forgiveness is like mercy. It is giving somebody something they don't deserve. It is receiving from God what you don't deserve, what I don't deserve, and passing it along. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that in this area of sexuality tonight. Uh, let's just take a minute. Whatever it is, whatever has happened, God wants to help you get over that. So I'm giving you a minute of silence right now. The beauty of God's grace is so refreshing, and we thank Him for His presence as we're working on this this evening. I still think of the Scripture, 1 John 1, 9, that talks about if we confess that He's faithful to forgive and cleanse. Cleansing means that it's as far as the east is from the west, He does not remember it. He chooses to offer us peace and grace, forgiveness, and His transparency. And so as we're talking this evening, we've been talking a lot about our sexuality and actually we're sexual beings. God made us that way. And He meant for a monogamous marriage to enjoy this sexuality of expression, of oneness, of coming together. And as I'm thinking about the questions that we have before us this evening, um, I was thinking of perhaps one other question that we could deal with as we prepare to close this evening, but most importantly that we would sense and experience uh, the Holy Spirit and His great grace in our lives, um, the beauty of sexuality. In all my years of therapy and as a pastor, I've never met someone that said that I, I'm just perfect in my sexuality. I'm the perfect example of healthy sexuality. Um, I've had most people say that this is an area of struggle, an area of trying to find God's help and strength um, because it's so complicated. And I Actually, it's so great to have you, Dr. Levy, to help us to even, even to see a portion of anatomy and how powerfully intricate it is. You were talking about an erection, you know, how powerfully intricate and that it's not a simple process. It's very integrative and very uh, susceptible uh, to challenge. So this, this beauty of sexuality, of being very sensitive to our mate, trying to understand, talking with our mate, listening more than talking, uh, that's exactly what God does for us. And inviting um, God in. Mm, yes. If there's one thing I could give you tonight, can you pray and say, Father, you are welcome here. Mm -hmm. Would you help us worship you? Thank you for the beauty mm -hmm. that you created. Hollywood didn't create sexuality. God created sexuality mm -hmm. for your enjoyment can you use that in a healthy way and invite Him to help you? And if you're having problems, what a great thing to pray about. Uh, what a great way to integrate God. And many of us haven't mm -hmm. even considered that that is mm -hmm. an option and that mm -hmm. God actually wants that. He looks forward to it. He's not embarrassed at all. So 
that's the number one thing I would try among uh, yeah. things that you might want to try. Yeah, and as you invite him in, I think you're, David, you're really referring to the fact is we invite him in, he does not shame us. No. And you mentioned earlier that many of us may well live with shame. It's one of the reasons why evangelical American couples that come together and that have cohabitated tend to have more of a challenge in their marriage because they carry the shame in and then they're, they're not able to welcome God into that area and help Him to work on that shame piece. Because shame means if we are shamed, we're bad at the core of who we are and that God never says that about us. No. He never sees us that way. That's the whole idea of atonement. That's the whole idea of justification. When God looks through Jesus and sees us, it's just as if it didn't happen when our heart is turned toward Him. Amen. So that beauty of, of actually asking God to deal with the shame that may be in the person's life. And shame is very debilitating. And it's not joy-filled, as you suggested. You know, I mean, you were suggesting, you know, you didn't say that, but you were su suggesting we're meant for joy. Right. And shame actually thwarts, stymies, and keeps joy almost an abatement. It's, it's, it's from us. We, we can't quite embrace it. And God wants us to be joy-filled. I think that's what I'm hearing you saying. And shame causes a lot of shame and guilt, a lot of sexual dysfunction. A lot of sexual dysfunction. Um, so, you know, getting forgiveness, it says in, in James, if, um, you know, that, that if you're not feeling forgiven, mm -hmm. to find someone else, if we confess our sins, you know, confess your sins one to another mm -hmm. and pray for one another that you may be healed. So there is something if, especially with sexual sin, often we don't feel forgiven because it still sort of haunts us because mm -hmm. the brain has wired it, imprinted mm. it so powerfully. We, yeah. we are forgiven, but we don't feel it. And sometimes going to someone else and confessing is, can be helpful in that as well. Yes. And finally, as we wrap this up before we close this evening, that God's grace is sufficient it's much more powerful than even an interaction with another person because we're interacting with the God of this universe who made us, who knows us, who can heal us, who can increase our hope, who can cause us to, to move into more healthy relationship. So thanks be to God. We're not too secular. When I say that, I don't mean to demean. We have wonderful colleagues in the secular world. I'm sure you do as well as I. But the fact is I'm thankful for God's grace in a discussion like this. I wouldn't want to be in this discussion without gr grace because we would just be talking about, hey, try this trick or that one or try this treatment. But without God's treatment, we're, we're far, far losing what we were really meant to be. So thanks be to God. Thank you, Dr. Levy, for joining us this evening. Thank you all for being here this evening. I want to mention to you, if you would like to continue this discussion, this we do have a class on Sunday mornings at 10.30. Dr. Levy will be with us again on Sunday. He's with us up into January where he will be with us the week prior to the Tuesday, my therapist says, and the week following, my therapist says. That's room 408 in the lower campus of this church at Skyline. Our next, my therapist says, is going to be dynamic, and that is November 1. It's going to be with Dr. David Levy. You may see that here. And it's called Handling Difficult Holiday Relationships. Wow. You are aware that most, the, the greatest depression time is January. It's not because it's foggy, because we have a lot of sunshine here in San Diego, California. But it's oftentimes following some very, very difficult holiday relationships. So November is helping us to prepare for Thanksgiving and other holidays that will follow. So we hope that you will come back. Those of you who are live streaming, we trust that you will be back with us as well. Handling Difficult Holiday Relationships, Tuesday, November 1st, 645 in this auditorium. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we will conclude for the evening. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your presence. I say it often, and I believe it with all my heart, that Your presence makes all the difference all the time. Thanks be to God for Your presence here. And we pray that somehow in the midst of all of the words, the verbiage, the thoughts, the biology, all of the issues that we're 
were discussed and talked about that most importantly, as we walk out of this sanctuary, we will sense Your presence. You made us. You want to offer grace. You want to disband shame. You want to do away with it, annihilate it. You want us to walk in joy. And so we thank You for that this evening. Bless each and every one in the sound of my voice. Most importantly, we know it's Your blessing, and we want to hear Your voice, and we trust that we have this evening. Thank You so much. We give You praise and honor this day in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you again for coming to My Therapist Says, and have a great, great evening.